Good morning. It's good to see you guys this morning. If you have your Bible, open it up to the New Testament Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. If you're a guest with us this morning, I want to welcome you in the room. There should be a card in the seat back in front of you. Take that card out, fill it out. You can drop in the offering plate at the end of the service. Uh, that lets us know that you're here. It gives us an opportunity uh, to connect with you. I hope you'll do that. If you're watching online, uh, there should be a connect card on the post. If you're watching on Facebook, share that. That helps us uh, kind of share our message, not just with our friends, but with your friends as well. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to the channel. Uh, we put out more and more content through social media, so be checking those avenues. Um, Matthew chapter 5. So we're in a series uh, on the Beatitudes, if you've been with us over the last few weeks. Uh, the Beatitudes are kind of the introduction to what really is one of the most significant teachings uh, that Jesus does. Jesus uh, has been thinking of the Sermon on the Mount. He puts that together. And uh, verse 1 of chapter 5 says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So his disciples and other people were there gathered around Jesus as he goes into this really significant teaching. And I think it's it's kind of cool that he puts it this way. And he's, he's kind of taking conventional thinking and turning it on its head. It's what he does really with all the Beatitudes, it says in verse 2, he opened his mouth and taught them, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted, the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, Last week, we talked about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And today, we're going to be talking about blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Now, just to be like, totally honest, this is probably more more honest, uh, maybe that should be, but mercy is not one of those things that come like really easy to me. I don't know about you guys, but um, um, mercy's just hard. So many times in my life, it seems like um, like with presented with a situation, I'm more prone to choose skepticism than I am to choose mercy. And uh, that probably says a lot more about uh, the darkness, I think, that's inside each and every one of us. I think there's just something about that. You know, mercy is not always my initial reaction. Oh, let me jump and show mercy in this situation. I found in my life is something that I, that I have to cultivate. And, you know, maybe you're like me. Maybe you're one of those. I, I really, truly envy people that are just able to jump in with sincerity into somebody else's situation and to just wait in, that, in there without any thought. Typically, that's not the way I react in, in situations. I want to do better about that. And honestly, this, this message, this idea of showing mercy is something that's a, that's a challenge for me. And uh, I hope it's, it's kind of a challenge for you guys. Over the last few weeks, kind of what we've done is started by saying, you know, this is what um, mercy is not. Or last week we talked about righteousness. This is what righteousness is not. So as we, as we think about it in those terms, here, here's what I want you to, to realize. Here's what mercy is not. Mercy is not just feeling sorry for somebody, right? That's easy to do. It's easy just to look at a situation, a bad situation, and from arm's distance to say, oh, man, that's terrible. I sure feel sorry for them. And uh, just go, ah, it's too bad. And then we kind of mosey on about our, our circumstances. That's easy to keep those kind of situations at arm's distance and say, I don't I don't really want to wade into that. I'm just going to say sorry right now and kind of go on my way. And I, I think we do that more often than we think. And I'm not just talking about, you know, you're riding down the road and you see somebody hold up a sign, you know, we'll, we'll work for food or please give money. You know, I think we're also quick to dismiss and put all these situations under that category. That's, well, that's really not the case. I mean, I think there are plenty of opportunities when we come like face to face with people who really need mercy in our life. Um, the Old Testament word for mercy is hesed. And it's, it's a really interesting word because there are some words in Hebrew and in Greek that just don't translate well into English. And hesed is one of those because it encapsulates so much more than you and I realize with just that word mercy. Like for us in, a, in our society, I, I don't know if we were to sit down and kind of write out a definition for mercy. Most of ours would probably be slightly different. The, the idea of mercy, as you see, hesed in the Old Testament, 
is to be able to step into somebody else's skin and feel life the way that they feel it, to see their life through their eyes and feel pain as they're encountering it and to truly walk with them through their circumstances. It's, that's that idea of kind of stepping into somebody else's mess. And that's, that's hard to do. It's a lot easier said than done. And I don't think we, we typically go that far with mercy. We're more comfortable keeping it at an at a arm's distance. But truly, uh, to experience or to show that mercy with somebody is to step into their situation with them. Um, and the, the very definition of the word is to sympathize. Uh, sympathize is a, is a part of hesed, of that idea, the Old Testament idea of, of mercy. But that, that's still, uh, when we use that English word for sympathize, that's almost like, oh, I feel sorry for them, you know, and nobody wants pity. So, you know, we kind of use that word loosely, but the Greek sympathize comes from, from two words. The, uh, the prefix, uh, that S-Y-N, sin, means uh, together with. And the second part of that word is uh, pashin, which means to experience or suffer. Uh, so literally, sympathize brings this idea of to suffer with. Again, stepping stepping into somebody else's situation or circumstances. So in, in the Bible, it's often used in a covenant sense that, you know, two people are covenanting together to enter into a situation. There's that attitude that both the parties are in the relationship with one another and for one another. So uh, it's one of those words we talk a lot about, but I'm not sure we really have our arms around. Um, mercy, uh, in the biblical sense, mercy is not getting something that we do deserve. Mercy is not getting something that we do deserve. Think about the uh, the death row inmate, you know, that gets that, that last minute pardon, that phone call. They're guilty. They deserve death or the or the penalty of death or whatever that is. And then the governor calls in at the last minute and uh, there's a stay. You know, mercy is extended. That's what mercy is. Mercy is not getting something uh, that we do deserve. Grace, on the other hand, is getting something that we don't deserve, getting truly more than we deserve. The, the best picture of grace is Jesus going to cross for our sins. We didn't deserve that. We don't do anything to earn it. It's just something that he did for us. So that's grace. And when we, when we look through the Bible, we see those, those words associated with God all the time. God is rich in grace. He's rich in mercy. And interesting that Jesus, as he's working his way through these Beatitudes, says, blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. So to work backwards through that, in order to receive mercy, we must be showing mercy is the way that the Bible puts that together. I want to read, uh, you just listen, I'm going to read this from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter uh, Ephesians chapter 2. This is one of those passages of scripture. If, uh, if you grew up in church, as, as I grew up in church, um, I think one of the most Common verses we use with salvation comes from like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And uh, see if this rings a bell, if this is familiar to you. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and uh, this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man should boast. So it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that nobody can boast. That's, that's a verse probably I've used a um, dozen or more so times, way more than a dozen, truthfully, when talking about salvation. But what's interesting is if you back up and look at Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, it says this, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love uh, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. I think Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 paints grace and mercy in such a powerful way uh, that we miss sometimes. But God, being rich in mercy, not giving us something we do deserve because of the great love with which he loved us. Why did he show us mercy? Because he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he's made us alive together with Christ. Then by grace, 
you have been saved through faith. It's by grace that you have been saved through faith. So mercy, not getting something uh, bad that we deserve. So when we talk about uh, this idea of mercy, being merciful really means three things. If you've got your notes, I challenge you to take that out, follow along. I'm going to give you some other verses of scripture uh, to kind of companion with that. And if you've got the Bible app, you can uh, click on events, live events, and there's an outline uh, for you there as well. So here's the first thing. If we're to be merciful, if we're to understand what being merciful means, that means that I must show compassion to those that are hurting. To be merciful means that I have to show compassion to those that are hurting. And uh, this may be one of those things that that you need to step into it maybe before you feel it, not just I'm going to wait till that feeling comes over me. I, I think we have to reprogram our minds to such a, a way that we're willing and ready to show compassion to people that are hurting, to be more willing to kind of take a step into uh, the mess that somebody else is struggling with. Jesus gave lots of really, really great examples of what mercy looks like. Jesus told a lot of stories. And uh, if you have your Bible, just turn over to Luke chapter 10. I want to remind you of what I think truthfully is one of the most powerful stories of this in the New Testament. Luke chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse 25. So this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. It says, uh, so behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. Uh, So a religious leader trying to test Jesus. And he says, hey, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And uh, he said to him, what's written in the law? This is Jesus talking. What's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbors yourself. And uh, Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. But he was uh, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, so who's my neighbor? So that's, that's really what it boils down to. Not just being able to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. Let's further define who's your neighbor. So Jesus tells this story about a good Samaritan. So if you understand the context of this, for a, for a Jew, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. A Samaritan was somebody that was hated by their culture. They just, they had nothing to do with Samaritans. So Jesus tells this story. It says a man going down for Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers, stripped him, beat him, left him for dead. And then he goes on and says, so by chance, a priest walks by. So the priest comes by, sees a man that's been beaten, been stripped of his clothes, laying in a ditch. And Jesus says, so the priest just kind of veered over the other side of the road and kept walking. Now, all the Pharisees out there, their antennas would have gone off and said, wait, wait. Priest should be the hero of the story, but instead what the priest does is he just walks on by. Then Jesus says, a Levite, the same thing. A Levite's walking by, sees the man beaten, stripped, laying in a ditch, left for dead, turns around, gets on the other side of the street and just keeps going. So by this point, all the religious people out there are scratching their head and saying, so if the priest isn't the hero of the story and a Levite's not the hero of the story, who's the hero of the story? And Jesus goes on and he says, and then... But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion, part of that root word of mercy. And he went to him, bound up his wounds, poured oil and wine. And he uh, put him on his animal, took him to the inn, took care of him, put him up. And he goes on, Jesus tells this whole story. Then he turns to, uh, then he turns to the Pharisees and, um, and he says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers. Remember the question, the Pharisee said, so, so who's my neighbor? So Jesus says, so of the three of those, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, which do you think proved to be a neighbor? And then the Pharisees, the, the lawyer was forced to say this. He said, the one who showed him mercy. The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, then go and do likewise. If we're to do what Jesus is calling us to do in this situation, we have to show compassion to people that are hurting. And that that requires something of us. We have to be willing to show that compassion to people that are hurting. 1 Peter 3, 8 says this, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. 
This is one of those, there's so much chalked into this one verse, but Jesus, or, or Peter's basically saying here, have unity of mind, sympathy, remember to, that willingness to, to suffer with someone, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. So that's what it takes to be willing to show compassion, to show mercy to people that are hurting. Well, that's the first thing. Here's number two, let's move on. Number two, if we're gonna show mercy, we have to be willing to accept people in spite of their faults, to accept people in spite of their faults. Um, to me, one of the most condemning passages of scripture uh, for myself as I read this, it always makes me cringe sometimes because I wonder, am I really doing a good job with this? Uh, Luke six thirty seven says, Jesus talking, and he says, judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Again, man, there is so much there. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. And again, let me say, if we're gonna show mercy, we have to be willing to accept people in spite of their faults. Now, isn't it easier to judge people because of their faults or to condemn people because of their faults? Or just say, you know what, I can't forgive that person. Look at what they've done. Look at all the, all, all the stuff that they've struggled with and just to write them off because of their faults. It's way easier to do that. If, you know, if Jesus had said, listen, judge, judge people, just judge them, condemn them, you know, don't, don't forgive them. Jesus turns all that upside down and says things to us that are really hard to do. Because when we, when we see people, we tend to judge people based on what they've done, based on the road that they've walked, based on the mistakes that they've made or, or done to us or something they've done to us. We always hold that up and say, you know what, I really struggle with this person because fill in the blank. And in the midst of that, Jesus says, well, you know what? Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned and forgive and you'll be forgiven. I think it's so apparent if you just stop and you really meditate on this, this, this is what Jesus is getting at. You know, if we could just encounter people and just have this supernatural ability just to dismiss all the junk that comes with that, all the mistakes, the scars, and, you know, all those things, and just say, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to judge. I'm just going to trust God with that. He's going to handle that. God will be the judge. Condemnation, that's a God thing. That's not a me thing. Yeah, I'll tell you what's a me thing. Forgive. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. You know, that's the positive end. The, the first two kind of carry a barb with it. Judge not, you'll not be judged. Condemn not. Uh, and you'll not be condemned, but forgive and you'll be forgiven. There's something to that I think that, that we, we struggle with because we're so quick to want to judge people based on what they've done. And if we, just, if we were to just think about that, if you, if you were to be judged off the worst three days of your life, how would people encounter you differently? Just think about, Maybe the, the three worst days, just from where you are, look back on your past and, and just kind of pull off that catalog, the, the three worst days of your life. And if we were to judge you based on that, how would people react differently to you? Typically what we do is when we experience people, we see those faults. We see the mistakes that they've made. And we say, well, you know, what? I, I can't, can't do that. I don't want to be associated with them because of what they've done or the mistakes that they've made. In the midst of that, Jesus says, hey, listen, judge not. Judge not, lest you be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. And forgive, and you'll be forgiven. If you have your Bible, flip forward to Matthew chapter um, chapter nine. This is the calling of Matthew, and this is really a a clear demonstration of what Jesus is talking about here. And this this is something that for us to hear individually and as a church. Uh, Matthew chapter nine, beginning in verse nine, it says, "So is Jesus." Passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in a tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he rose and, and he followed him. So a little bit about what's happening in the background. Matthew's a tax collector, and uh, again, if you've seen that series, The Chosen, they depict this so, so well. See, the, they kind of 
paint something that's not maybe so apparent from Scripture that there was like a this friction between Matthew and the disciples because uh, Matthew, being a tax collector, he had he had just been robbing them, li- living off their backs for so long. Not just Matthew. That's just what a tax collector did. In this society, uh, different from the way the tax collectors are in our society, the modern IRS, in this society, what the, the tax collectors would do is they would take what's due Rome from you, they would collect your taxes, and then whatever they can get above that, they can just put in their pocket. That's how they, that's how they made a living. They would just collect the taxes and then like a little surcharge for that just to pay the bills. And that, that's why the Jews and everybody in that society hated tax collectors. So Jesus, in the context of that, in the midst of that, comes to Matthew sitting in a tax booth and he said, follow me, and he followed him. Now, if that sounds a little odd, this isn't as uncommon as you and I might associate with it. a teacher. It wasn't uncommon for a teacher to go by and see somebody and say, hey, come and follow me. And, and people would follow teachers all the time. And they would go and they would learn under them. They would be discipled under them. And that's kind of what Jesus is doing is taking this tax collector and bringing him under his wings. Say, follow me, follow me. Then they go on in verse 10. So, and as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And the disciples said, I don't know. No, it didn't say that. Look at verse 12. It says, but, but when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Notice the disciples didn't answer there because probably they were shrugging their shoulders. This is early in the ministry of Jesus and they're probably like, I don't know. Why does he? That's a great question. Why is Jesus hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? Because I sure wouldn't be here. All of the other, the, the Jews, the disciples that were there at that time, they were, this was just as puzzling to them as it was the people on the outside. And Jesus gives a clear defense of what he's doing. He says, so Jesus heard what they said. And then verse 12, when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So go and, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And I would tell you this morning that you and I would do well to meditate on that, just the whole context of what that means for ourselves. Jesus says, go and learn what this means. You and, you and I need to learn this as well. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So Jesus isn't pleased or he's not impressed with all the fancy things that we bring. He says, listen, I'm not about that. What I desire is mercy. So Jesus paints as clear a picture of that as could possibly be painted. And he's telling us that we have to be willing if we're gonna show mercy. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. We're gonna show mercy. We have to accept people in spite of their faults. And that takes something for you and I. I, I, I'll tell you for me, for sure, that means I've got to reprogram my brain, dismiss a lot of the judgment and the condemnation that would usually go with that and say, you know what, all that's a God thing. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take them for, for where they are in spite of the past, in spite of the mistakes. Because if we don't do that as a church, where, where is that gonna be done? If we don't do that as the hands and feet of Jesus, who's gonna show that kind of mercy to people? We have been called to demonstrate that kind of, of mercy. We've got to show compassion to those who are hurting, accept people in spite of their faults. And then the last thing, we're going to close with this this morning, extend forgiveness to those who have hurt you deeply. Extend forgiveness to those who have hurt you deeply. And um, it goes without saying, but we probably need to restate this. That also means that you need to seek forgiveness from those you have wronged. We're really quick to talk about forgiveness and and people that have hurt you and things that have happened like that. And we kind of just kind of jump over the fact that, you know what, there there are probably people that I've wronged too. I need to be mindful of that. Are, Are there people that I need to go and sit down and just seek forgiveness from? Jesus was so serious about this that in Matthew chapter chapter of five, later on in, in the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, 
leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Jesus is so serious about that that he says, listen, before you offer your gift, you need to, you need to first go be reconciled to your brother or sister. It's that important. Go and settle that matter first, then come and offer your gift. I think we forget sometimes as Christians how tied together our vertical relationship is with our horizontal relationships. See, if you're out of fellowship with a brother or sister in Christ, or I would even submit to you, if you're you're just uh, have forgiveness that needs to be extended or received, it's going to impact your relationship with the Lord. Until this is right, uh, this isn't going to be everything that it's supposed to be. Those things, those things are more closely related than we realize. So uh, we need to take that seriously. We need to go. If there's somebody uh, with which that we need to extend forgiveness or we need to ask forgiveness, go. Do that first, Jesus says. So we've got to seek forgiveness from people that we've wronged. And we also need to be willing to extend forgiveness. And the Bible gives a really good recipe for that. In Matthew 18, 15, it says, so if your brother uh, sins against you, go and tell him his fault just between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And if he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or tax collector. So that's that's a really, and I, I love boxes that I can check. So this this really makes sense to my mind. If you're if you have a relationship that's kind of been fractured, what what Jesus is is saying here is, listen. If you have a relationship that's fractured, you need to go and just sit down with that person, just just you and that person alone, and and try to work that out. And if you work it out, you've gained a brother or sister. But if that doesn't work, then then the Bible says, then get a couple of friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, and just go and and all of y'all sit down and and try to work that out together. Bring reconciliation. It's it's that important. And if if that doesn't work, then like the final step in that process is, you know, tell it to the church and then let them be to you like a Gentile or tax collector. And so many people misunderstand that. They said, yeah, that's it. We're going to treat them like a Gentile or tax collector. We're going to lower the hammer. No. Go back to what we shared earlier. What was Jesus doing with the tax collectors and sinners? He's hanging out with them. Those are the dudes that Jesus would seek out. He was always trying to seek people that were far from God to sit down, to build a relationship with. And that, that's the end result. If, there, if we can't find that reconciliation, then that, that means we need to try to nurture that relationship and pursue them and try to bring about resolution to what's happened. If we're gonna show mercy, we have to be willing to extend forgiveness. I would say even especially to people that have hurt you deeply. And that, that's a hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to do because when we're, when we're wounded, I used to have a friend that would, he had this saying, and it stuck with me for so long, you know, wounded dogs bite back. And when, when you're wounded, your, your first inclination is you, you want to bite back at people. I'm not, I'm not looking for reconciliation. When we're hurt, we want to hurt back. But Jesus takes all that and he just turns it on his head and said, no, that's not the way we're going to handle that. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In uh, Ephesians chapter four, verse 32, this is Paul talking to the church at Ephesus. And he says this in Ephesians four thirty-two. he says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Isn't that powerful just to think about? He's saying, listen, here, here's the first thing, just just be kind one to another. Be tenderhearted. Forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. See, because that's what God did for us. That's the mercy and the grace that he's shown us. We deserve the penalty of death, but instead he gave us grace by sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. God showed that to us, So he's asking us in turn as his hands and his feet to show mercy to the people around us that are hurting. 
given them something they don't deserve. Even when we're wounded, even when we've been hurt by other people, we're still to show the grace and mercy that the Father has shown us through Jesus. I want to ask you to bow your heads and I want to ask our our team to come out. We're going to close with a song right here in a moment. But in the quietness of this moment, I just want to leave you with a challenge. I know that in a room this size, there, there are some of you as we talk about the idea of mercy and forgiveness and those, those type of things that you realize that there may be a brother or a sister or somebody in your life where there's a fractured relationship that you know needs to be made right. My challenge for you would be just in the, in the quietness of this moment, just to, just to say, God, I, I pray through the power of the Holy Spirit uh, that you would just show me uh, where I've maybe in the wrong and, and help me to be about bringing reconciliation to this relationship. And maybe that's something that begins with a phone call after service or just a text message, just to reach out to somebody and say, I'm sorry, or I need your forgiveness. I don't know what that looks like, but for I would challenge you and submit to you that as, as believers, that's really important that we are in right relationship. Jesus says, by this will all men know you're my disciples by the way that you love each other. So we need to love each other well. That means showing forgiveness to each other. Some of you are here today and you realize that, that mercy is something that maybe doesn't come natural for you either. And that you realize that, that you need to be a, do a better job of maybe being the hands and feet of Jesus. Maybe what you need to do is in the quietness of this moment, just say, God, I I pray that you would just give me your heart, compassion. Uh, Give me your eyes so that I can see people the way that you see them. And Lord, help me not to be quick to judge, to not be quick to condemn, but to forgive and to show grace and mercy in all my relationships. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you've loved us. And we're grateful that while we were dead in our sin and our trespasses, that you showed us grace and mercy. So, Father, may we be about that in all that we do. Help us to show your love, your grace, your mercy to everyone we come in contact with so that they may be able to see a clear reflection of Jesus in our life. And we pray these things in the name of the Son. Amen. Would you stand as we worship together?